of the things that we've experienced in our life because we are made up of our stories. A lot of us is caught and taught in our life rather than just ingrained in us. You are a product of your story, and we want you to engage in the story that God's telling because that's what walking with Jesus is all about. It's about helping, allowing him to heal the pain in our life, to bring out great parts of our story that, that show up in pretty sometimes some pretty undesirable ways. We've been talking about this for several weeks. We rewind to the first week of the series. We've been playing with the spelling of this word epic. And we started out by saying that every part of your story is crucial. That's what makes an epic life is a person who recognizes that our story is not a series of disconnected events. You didn't get hurt as a kid and then have children later and then get married and, and wind up dealing with similar issues in your marriage that, that came from when you were a kid. Right? Because we struggle through the story we talk about. The story we live out is our struggle because it's always been the effort of the enemy to sow this thread that runs through our life. In fact, the next week we talked about, played again with the spelling of it, and we said that every pain is crucial. We talked about how it was important for us to engage in the story that God's telling through our pain, difficult things that every one of us experience. Every person in this room, no exceptions, myself included, have parts of our story that we'd like to go back and do over, things I'd like to change or edit. There are whole parts of my story, even years, where I'd like to select them and delete them and forget they ever happened, right? There are all parts of our story that we regret, things that we wish didn't happen to us, things that we did, things that were just the result of being in this world around us that have caused us pain. And every pain that you and I experience is a crucial part of our story. When we follow Jesus, nothing in our story gets wasted. He redeems the difficult and painful things, even when people in our life didn't mean to cause those pain things to us. Those painful things still play out in our lives every day. And this is what reading, having a relationship with Jesus is about, is walking with him through the difficult times in our lives. Not just through the difficult times, but through the restoration and the healing of the pain that we've experienced in life. That was, I didn't make that noise. I just want you to know, because I thought there was some question on some of your faces. <laughs> Freak me out just a little. Anyways, but one of the things that we've talked about last week is how valuable and how important prayer is in our walk with Jesus, in our restoration of our story, in our epic life. And we talked about how every prayer is crucial. And we talked about how important it was for us to not talk about prayer in just the grocery list kind of way. You know, the bless them, keep them, heal them, you know, be with them, support them, traveling mercies, that kind of list. Those are good things, and I'm not, I'm not knocking that, but that's a, that's a part of this deal. But we talked about using prayer as a weapon to stand against the enemy and, and walk through some of our pain and, and be able to, to reclaim the territory that we've given up. And we're going to talk about all of that today. But we want to do it in a little different way, because I've got to be honest with you, the church isn't always very good at this. The church, or Christians, tend to celebrate people who we think have arrived, right? We have a tendency to say, well, this person looks right, their life is good, and they have a tendency to, we have a tendency to say, they've now gotten way past all their brokenness, and they can look up and kind of stand with a big chest and say, yeah, I used to be that person, right? I was into sex and drugs and rock and roll, and then I got saved at the age of seven, and God just pulled me out, right? Like, that, that's the, the tendency we have. We love to hear those stories because it gives us hope, but we celebrate the big victories, and we very rarely walk through the most important, in fact, the epic accomplishments of our lives are not those night and day differences. The, the thing that the church has gotten terrible at is recognizing the value of our stories. This summer, I, we took a vacation with our family. It was an awesome vacation. It was different for us. We normally are a go-to-a-place family. You know, we go to the beach or we go to this thing and we stay at this place. And you know how those things go. You leave your house and you go to wherever you're going. 
the space between leaving your house and arriving at the beach is just, it's just the necessary evil, right? You know, the driving, the flying, the whatever you got to do to get from here to there. And vacation doesn't really start until you get there, right? I mean, that's most of the time. This year we did something different. We borrowed a, an RV, like a motorhome, like a fancy glamping thing, you know, like we got in it and you drive it and you can do all this stuff. And so I said, we sat down with the girls right before we left and we kind of got ready. We started the car and said, okay, before we go, we're just going to spend a minute just praying together. And I just want us to understand what, what's about to happen because it's different than we've ever done before. And there are two really big differences because what we were doing was we were leaving our driveway and we were going to make a big loop we were driving out west, right? We were going to sleep in Walmart parking lots in the RV, which is weird and scary and hilariously fun. And, and so we were going to do that. And then we were going to sleep in, in campgrounds. And we were going to see the Grand, the Grand Canyon. And we are going to see all these places and, and, and experience stuff like, you know, Cadillacs buried in the, gr in the ground. And you can go over and spray paint them and crazy stuff. I wanted to see like the world's biggest ball of tinfoil and stuff like that, but we didn't get to that. But, but like, but those things were what we were new. And, but for us, well, the one thing that was important for us to recognize is that we're not going to vacation. The minute we drive out of the driveway, we are on vacation. Every time the wheels turn over it is a new thing that we get a chance to celebrate. So enjoy every part of it, because if you don't enjoy every step of it, every view out the window, every time the tires roll over in this thing, you're going to hate this time. Because if you're always trying to get to the destination, you'll always be discouraged. The journey is the destination. And then that's really the most important thing we had to walk away with is that the whole thing, the driving, the, the being together, the view out the window, every part of it, the journey was the destination. And here's the thing that's interesting about it is from the minute we drove out of the driveway to the minute we got back, we were always headed home. We weren't, we weren't always headed to something. We were always ultimately just making a big loop and headed home. And it was just a long roundabout scenic tour to get back home. And that's exactly where your life is. Why is it? that we get so enamored with a destination. I've got to get to this place in my life, but I'm not quite there yet. I want to be that person, but I'm this person. We get this, all this condemnation. We feel like, yes, I've made some progress. I'm not where I want to be. I'm not where I should be. That's what we feel like, right? But why is it that we don't evaluate that statement? We hear in our head, this voice of condemnation telling us, I'm not where I should be. I'm not where I want to be. I'm not there yet. But we don't balance that with, with words like Romans 8.1, where he says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why don't we evaluate that condemning voice that comes into our head and tells us that we're not measuring up, that we're not good enough, that we're not where we should be? Why don't we say, no, there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. So today, I just want to invite you in, and this is a little different for us. I want to invite you in, and let's celebrate some journey, right? Let's celebrate some, some stories along the way, some parts of the, of the passage, because the truth of it is that that's the big idea of the series, is that you'll either live in the redemption of your pain, or you will live from your pain. It's up to you. It's really between you and God is whether or not you will live out of the redemption of your pain, of your story, or you'll live out of the pain in your story. And my hope is that at the end of the day, you're able to decide for you, which one do you want to do? Because you're going to live out of your story. The story that God's told in your life, that the story the enemies try to tell in your life over the, over the course of your life is something that you will live out of. You'll either live out of the redemption of it or you'll live out of the pain in it. It really is just a matter of how much you want to engage. So I want to just tell you John's story. John sent me this. He said, I got involved with Celebrate Recovery because I thought that there was so much junk in my life that I'd gotten cleared out, that the Father had healed, that I could be a blessing to others. As I started working through the program, I realized just how much junk there was still in my life that still needed to be dealt with. It always bothered me that my brothers and I, when my brothers and I would talk, they always seem to be so livid with my mother 
They felt like they could never do anything right to please her. Whatever they did, there was another way of doing it or a reason she did, that we didn't do it right. Even my wife would observe the same thing at times. She would say, no matter how you do it or what you do, my mom always never seems to be happy. It didn't really ring a bell with me because I'm a touch person. I hear and express love to people by touching. My mom hugged me, so I thought that she loved me. But what I did realize was that her hugging me allowed me to feel like she loved me, and I realize now that sometimes being loved by someone can be like alcohol or drugs or food. It can serve to cover up a lot of underlying pain. And when I didn't deal with the pain, it led to habits and hangups in my life. As I've worked through some of my pain, I've begun to understand that it is while, I, while it's devastatingly painful when I get fussed at or when, I, when I've done something wrong or not gotten it exactly right, I, it doesn't matter that I've heard 10 good things, 10 things that I've done right. The only thing that I hear is criticism. I come to realize that my brothers were right. There was really no way to please mom. And as I've walked through the principles of CR, I've been able to understand and find a way to forgive my mom. I, I realize now that at work and at home, when I don't do something just right, that I don't have to take it personally when I fall short of the goal there's been a sense of freedom in my heart. It's if something gets to me, I don't turn around and beat myself up for days just because I didn't get it right. It's amazing to me when you see it because that's the, the thing that we don't, we don't celebrate those stories. When people do, when people have very substantial uh, of victories in their life, but they're not really visible, right? They're, we don't celebrate when somebody finds encouragement. We don't celebrate when somebody finds, uh, finds victory over pain in their life. We have a tendency to celebrate when they get clean. We have a tendency to celebrate when their marriage gets better. And then we don't even celebrate until they prove that they're going to stay clean and that their marriage is going to stay together. What I love is that the journey, the journey is the destination, and John gets it. For John, I love that he chose to, to live in the healing rather than from the pain. Constantly living from the pain that we've experienced is, is a crippling idea. Let me share a story we're going to call Armintha's story. It's not really her name because not a lot of people are named Armintha. And you might ask, who's Armintha? That's my great-grandma's name. She died when she was almost 102. And you know what she would say if she was alive today? Get me out of this box. I can't breathe in here. Okay. She would think that joke was hilarious. I'm just saying. Okay. Most people would say that I had a fairly well-adjusted childhood. I loved playing outside. I loved waiting, on, uh, waiting with a couple quarters in my pocket for the ice cream man to come. I loved it when the fire department came and drained the hydrant. I particularly loved chasing the mosquito truck. That might explain some lost brain cells. My parents were like the ones on TV. He worked and she stayed at home to cook and clean. But in that safe environment, things happened that began to shape who I would become. At an early age, a group of boys in my neighborhood violated me. I know it wasn't my fault, but, I, but that moment is frozen in my memories and a lifetime of fear and anxiety began. As a result, I became my, began my codependent lifestyle early, trying to manage everyone else's happiness. I had a sister who seemed to be constantly displeased with me. I remember having to do everything I could to keep her happy. We shared a room, and I have vivid memories of, uh, of her complaints that I breathed too loud. I remember seeing being in my own little twin bed, holding my breath and trying not to irritate her. It's no wonder that I began to succumb to anxiety, because I worried about everything. I worried about crossing the big street. Or what if the crossing guard wasn't there and I got hit by a car? What if I messed up in school? What if I got in trouble? I remember having, t having a teacher hit my hand for missing a math problem. And school stress remained a problem for me as I grew up. Not fitting in, being made fun of, low self-esteem. And overwhelming a fear in, of disappointing people. Story after story of the stomach aches from the stress. Once the teenager's world set in, I added big girl stress to my list of worries. What if I get into a car wreck, this girl drama, the images of the perfect body that I saw in the mirror? We didn't attend church much as a kid. 
I remember and I loved it when the Baptist group would come into our neighborhood and bribe us with McDonald's cheeseburgers and popsicles. I got on board every time for the free snacks. And I remember when the preacher would point at me and say, do you want to spend eternity in hell? I remember being terrified. So I got saved and baptized many times just to help curb the fear. In my high school years, I did whatever it took to fit in. I drank and I smoked and I smoked weed. And after graduation, I met my husband and immediately grew, knew that he was the one. We dated and partied, enjoyed life and got married. And then I got pregnant. After 15 weeks, I lost the baby. When you lose a baby, it's a unique grieving experience. You're sad for a little bit, but the life forces you back into rhythm. At least that's what seemed to happen for everyone else. I went back to work and my husband went back to hunting. I continued, I continued to mourn in silence. After a few months, I, I found out that I was pregnant again. And over the next several years, I, that son and two more followed. The fear and anxiety I had never dealt with now had the perfect place to live and grow in the powerful and overwhelming years of motherhood. Because I, of my fear, I quit drinking. What happens if, uh, what, if something happened? What, if somebody needed to be sober to rush him to the hospital? My husband was still drinking, and I felt like it was my responsibility to uh, raise these three kids alone. My identity changed. I lost who I was. I became a mom, a wife, a nurse, a caregiver to my aging parents. My life existed to make sure that everyone around them, me was fed and safe and happy and content. If my kids were happy, then, my, then maybe it would turn out okay. If my husband was happy, maybe he wouldn't drink. So goes the codependent story of my life. When I started working through the pain in Celebrate Recovery, the first, the first principle was really hard for me. Realize that I am not God. I have, to, I have always felt that everyone's moods, their feelings, and behaviors were mine to control, and it was my responsibility to fix them. I felt the grief of everyone else's bad choices. When my boys made bad choices, I tortured myself, wondering, what have I done to fail them? After watching two of the boys get kicked out of Christian school, two DUIs, a near-fatal wreck, each traumatic event left me feeling like I was my place to make it right, to make everything work well. When the boys grew up and moved on with their life, I felt like I wasn't needed anymore. My boys are gone, my husband and I are just existing and I'm getting older. My unresolved self-esteem and body issues returned with a vengeance. So I went to the gym and spent time with my friends. And it, most nights uh, he played with, played, found some new friends and they played cards and drank, which ended many nights passed out on the couch. I became very lonely. I quickly grew tired of nagging him about the drinking, so I checked out and told him that I was done. Let me tell you this, loneliness is a dangerous place to be. The enemy knows that if he can isolate us, he can influence us. The, the, the enemy led me to be completely consumed with hurt and disappointment and depression. I agreed with the enemy that it will never get better. You used to, you, he used that time and that agreement to gently lead me down the dark path where I would find comfort in an inappropriate relationship that would last on and off for the next several years. I often wondered, how on earth did I end up here? I'm the person who worries about hurting someone's feelings. I'm the person who worries about hitting a butterfly with my car. How could I be doing the very thing that I would be angry with other people for? Everything crashed when I was discovered. My best friend, my best friend turned her back on me because she felt betrayed by my dishonesty. My marriage was a wreck. It was pretty much the lowest point of my life. But when I felt, while I felt completely alone, God never abandoned me. Working through the steps of CR led me to make amends with the people around me that I've hurt. That was the hardest thing I've done, making amends. I, I record, I, it required accepting the death of everything that I had hoped for. I had high hopes that everything would one day return to normal, but God was gracious and kind to me as I worked through the principle of his plan and came to understand that he was positioning my story for, his, for the next step in his plan, not mine. Over the next couple of years of recovery, I found love and acceptance in my CR family. I found redemption of my choices, restoration of my marriage, and I've even been able to grieve the loss of my baby, helping someone else with, deal with the aftermath of her own miscarriage. Recently, I even gave my son a name and found out his birthday, and I celebrated 31 years since that terrible experience. 
I've carried all of that pain for a long time. But God has used CR to restore my strength, peace, hope, and faith, and he's given me joy. These lies, the, the, those lies that the enemies, the enemy, those lies of the enemy that I believed were what kept me feeling unloved and unworthy are now recognized for what they were. They were lies. God has never left me alone, never forsaken me. He's always been working behind the scenes to redeem me, to make my life whole, and to work out his best for my life. Do you see what's going on? I mean, there's this pattern of behavior, this pattern of things that happens. When we, when we experience pain, there's a moment where the, where the opportunity, where the, where the enemy comes in with a crowbar, and he finds that pain to be a leverage point, a place where he can kind of wedge in and pry on it. And then in the process, just simply offer his perspective on the pain. You're a loser. It'll always be that way. It'll never be enough. You'll never fix this. It'll always, he'll always respond like that. She'll never understand you. They'll never view you that way. You're not like the other guys. You're never going to be enough. You're ugly. You're fat. Do you hear what happens? The enemy sends those messages and looks for us simply to make agreements. Now, none of us would sign a contract, right? None of us are going, oh, yes, the enemy offered me that, and I agreed with him. But the truth is we do it all the time. We live our lives believing the lies of the enemy. The lies lead to agreements, not a written agreement, just an operational agreement, a way we view things. Let me share another story with you. This one is anonymous. It says, I grew up in a home with an older sister who regularly beat the crap out of me. It may sound like a typical older sister picking on her little brother, but it's far more significant than that, and to me, it was deeply painful. It seemed to develop into a theme for most of my life, being bullied and picked on by bigger kids. I remember one example. This kid pushed me down from behind in the fifth grade, sat on my chest, and hit me in the head repeatedly in front of about 15 of my classmates. I jumped up when he got off me, and I was going to get him back, but my cousin pulled me away, took me to the office, which only made the bullying worse. The enemy leveraged that pain to get a foothold in two primary areas of my life. Lust and anger. Both have been significant struggles in my, in my life over the years. I've been working and praying over the last three years to trust God with the wounds from my past and find freedom from my lust and anger. What I've come to understand was that every time I experienced wounding, I made agreements that, I, that have greatly affected the way I see things. When you grow up with people pushing you around all the time, you learn pretty quickly to use your anger as a defense mechanism, or at least I did. I didn't want to be the floor mat where people wipe their feet, so I began getting aggressive and using anger as a way to stand up for myself. The enemy told me that, if, that I could control things if I would let my anger demand control. I still struggle today to give control of my anger to Jesus and invite him in to heal that wounded, bullied little boy. Another way that the enemy has been influencing my life is lust. I've been struggling for years with pornography, and, and I struggle every day with objectifying women. Over the last three years, I've experienced a lot of healing and seen, to do, seen God do amazing things. And each phase of healing comes with me close, being closer and closer to freedom. Most recently, I was at work, when, and, there was, and there was a woman nearby. I was checking her out. I don't know why, because I don't think of her as attractive, but I was looking at her anyway. As I was checking her out, I, a thought came to my mind as clearly as if God was standing next to me. You've been objectifying women for most of your life. This is different than the condemning voice that I have heard uh, many times. I can't believe you think those things, or you're a terrible person, or you're worthless. There's a kindness and gentleness to this voice. Not the condemning, accusing voice of the enemy. Simply, a gen simply and gently reminding me, that I've been objectifying women out of resentment and hatred for how my sister treated me. This is a completely different battle than trying not to think sexual thoughts. Now I'm beginning to see God work, not just in not doing the wrong thing, but in redeeming my value for women. Do you see what happens 
When we make an agreement in our life, when we, when we operate in a certain way and we go, man, this painful thing happened and now women are no longer a, a, a person. They're an object that is something I hate, I, I despise, I'm angry at. The enemy leverages that and then it becomes a lifestyle, a way that we live out the lies that we've made into agreements and agreements wind up leading us to action. They lead us to a place in our life where we live our life. The action of our life is lived out of this misunderstanding, this poor way of communicating. And then we feel all the condemnation. You're terrible. How do you think those things? You can't believe you'd go to church and then look at that. I can't believe you'd do this. And we feel all that condemnation that goes on top of us. And then we go, well, I got to manage it. I got to stop looking at porn. I got to stop doing that. I got to stop acting that way. And we can't manage our behavior and hope to get to our heart. Experience transformation is inviting Jesus into the pain and healing our heart. And it comes out in our life, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. That we invite him in and by the renewing of our mind in Christ Jesus, then we begin to see him living out of our life. It's a powerful difference. Can you imagine how much despair you'd feel if you were trying to stop objectifying women just by stopping looking at things, eventually you'd realize that there's hopeless. And we realize that the source is what really needs treatment. That's where God can work. It's a powerfully different story. But it doesn't always have to end this way, right? It doesn't always have to show up in massive ways. In all of our lives, it shows up differently. Some of us it, it, like carry it, it carries us to a really de- terrible place and we wind up addicted to something or we wind up despairingly lost in an inappropriate relationship or we wind up struggling with pornography or anger. But man, for many of us, it's just a quiet despair that's constantly happening in our life. In fact, I want to tell you, this story is particularly close to me. It's my wife's story. She said, I would never have guessed that in my 40s, I would be struggling with my identity. Who am I? What am I good at? What is my purpose? These are just a few of the key questions that I've struggled with. Instead of taking these questions to God, I was looking to my husband and my kids to find my purpose and fulfill me. That's an impossible task to ask of my family. They can't fill me up, and they can't answer all of those questions. The only person who can answer them is God. My mind really is a battlefield. I continue to learn daily that I have to take every single thought captive. When I don't take my thoughts captive, they take me captive and take me on a ride on a crazy train, and that's that's when I uh, begin to make agreements with the enemy, which is what was what is happening. For me, I was hearing that I'm not important enough to be needed or valued. When I I was living in fear, saying no to the things that God had called me to because of the lies I believed about myself and having me feel so insecure. For instance, I can remember thinking that I must not be important enough because of the most of the relationships that I had, I was the one pursuing them. How crazy is that? All I know is that All I know is that those thoughts left me feeling like I was not needed or I'd had no purpose. The enemy knows my weakness, and I believe there there is a little truth in the lies he tells me so that it makes it easier for me to believe. For years, I was making agreements. When I would make an agreement, it created a stronghold, and the strongholds were holding me back and taking me prisoners locked in the chains of deception. I was believing the lies that the enemy and of the enemy and began to see myself and my circumstances through those lies. It literally paralyzed me. I have learned that I don't take my if I don't take my thought captive, they will take me captive. This is not something I've been I've perfected. I've but I continue to work on it. In fact, I have a little sticky note on my bathroom mirror that says, "God, help me not to think anything about myself, others, or the situations today." that don't line up with your truth. I have learned only God can answer these questions. Who am I and what was Sheila created specifically for? See, we have a tendency to only separate and celebrate the the gigantic victories, the destination moments. But it's really these, these subtle, simple moments in our life that we turn over to God. When we begin to understand that pain leads to lies, lies lead to agreements, agreements lead to action, 
And then action leads to despair. We get to these hopeless moments in our life where we operate in this spiral that just keeps taking us down and down and down in our life until we don't see hope or value in anything that's left. That's where Tony was. He said, I, I have everything together. I'm in control of what I do every day. I can make things happen. I can fix everything. I can do it myself. I don't need help. These are some of the agreements I was hiding behind for many years, and I don't, and I didn't even know it. There's a wound somewhere in my story that I have, haven't been able to pinpoint, but for somewhat, for but I sure know when somebody sticks their finger in it. It was so painful. I know that the exact day that my wife exposed my wound, she was. It was so damaging to me that it took seven and a half years to get past the feelings that I had that day. If I told you what she said, you may not think much of it. But because your story may not have that wound, because of the agreements that I had, there was no way to forgive her for what she said. The enemy loved that. He took that unforgiveness and constantly used it to control my thoughts and my actions. And after years, I felt more and more weight on me and no way that I could get out from under it. It was helpless. I couldn't fix it myself. May of 2018, six and a half years later, I was sitting on some boulders in the Rocky Mountain, pouring my feelings out to God. And I looked down between my feet and I saw this little sprig of grass between two big boulders. And when God said to me, that's you, the boulders are the problems weighing on you, but I, you can be renewed just like that little sprig of green grass coming out of the boulders. That's what that moment was very special to me. And I literally curled up and wept. As months passed, I continued to be weighed down with the burdens, and I know, that, I know that it's because I still didn't forgive, and the enemy took advantage of it. I prayed for relief, and one day that, that prayer was answered in a very painful way. That's right, it was painful, like a huge fish hook removed from my hand. And then I was immediately relieved and thankful that my problems were being addressed. I was also God's way of telling me that I must forgive in order to be renewed. I had told myself many times that I had forgiven my wife, but I never told her. That day I told her that it was more, even more rewarding. Up until that moment, I had, I had thought about what she had said to me and every day and every moment I was around her. That resentment went away as soon as I said, I forgive you. Three words, I forgive you, brought back joy to my life. That joy was what that joy is what I look for every day, and I know that it's available to me if I fight and resist the enemy and ask God for help in the battle and listen to what he's saying to me. Pain is substantial in our lives. It offers an opportunity for the enemy to lie. It gives the, us an opportunity to agree with the lies he tells us that lies lead to action, and it carries us down this terrible moment where we finally feel despair and we see what the enemy's been up to all along just like we talked about earlier john chapter 10 jesus said i came to give you life and give it abundant the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy first peter 5 says that, that the enemy is like a roaring lion looking for someone that he can devour. He wants to tear us down he wants to kill and destroy our lives you see these stories we see where Tony was at. My marriage is hopeless. They'll never, there's never hope for restoration until God says, you're just this little sprig of grass that I'm bringing up between the boulders of your life. But it's not about arriving. It's not about this unbelievable moment where I went from, from, from like sex, drugs, and rock and roll to now I'm a follower of Jesus and I don't struggle with sin anymore. I'm still in the journey because the journey is the destination. I won't take much longer, but I want to close with Lisa's story. As far back as I can remember, I've always been fat. My earliest memory of being embarrassed about my body goes back to when I was four years old. I was wearing my favorite shirt and it had a big rainbow across the front and straps that tied over the shoulder and just a small part of my stomach showed. That was back in 1984, so we put that shirt on with some red pants and I was the coolest kid around until I wore it at my brother's first grade open house. And one of the bigger's kids lifted his shirt and poked his belly out and made a mocking and disgusting face with his buddies and they laughed. I'm pretty sure that was it, the turning point for me. Crazy thing is I wasn't fat, of course not. 
I was four, but I was, it was, there was another voice in my head that told me from that moment on that I was fat and disgusting and something to be laughed at. And interestingly enough, I decided at the ripe old age of four that there was, that these things were out of my control. That's the crazy part. I decided right then and there that I could do nothing about it. I packaged up all those feelings and became insanely insecure teenager and ultimately even less emotionally secure adult. At some point in my early teenage years, I decided to add in the recipe of a healthy sprinkling of your stupid and worthless. By high school, I was often running into a ridiculously low self-esteem and a great sense of humor. I have a theory that most people that have, uh, that have had, uh, I have a theory that the people who have had to overcome heavy things in their life, whether self-inflicted or out of their control, usually develop a pretty great sense of humor. If there's someone in your life that you think is hilarious, they probably have a story there somewhere. Anyway, I was, I was always the funny one in the crowd, that, the one telling the, fa- the stories with the people gathered around at lunch. This is when I began, began calling myself the fat girl. As a, as a defense mechanism to let everyone know that I already knew I was fat and I beat you to the joke or a comment so that you wouldn't that you would make it my expense. I win. I was the original fat Amy, if you will. My best my best friend in high school was beautiful and thin, and of course all the guys wanted to date her. They wanted to hang out with me, but they wanted to date her. And and wet and who could blame them? No one dates the fat girl. Fast forward to adulthood and I would look at people who had been married since they were fresh out of high school and still going on and still going strong, raising children, attending church together. Their lives were probably perfect and they had no problems or arguments ever. And why? Because she was thin in high school and no one is ever going to want to devote their life to someone who's that fat and stupid. This went on ever. This went on until about my mid thirties when I suddenly out of nowhere decided that maybe I could lose some weight. I simply omitted the foods that were causing the greatest harm and the weight began to fall off. I ended up losing between 50 and 60 pounds total and all because I decided it was possible. That's how the enemy gets to me. He's not creative. He's persistent. He's been whispering in my ear for over 30 years that the, that other people have, have it all and that I have nothing because one, I don't deserve it. Two, I'll never be good enough. And three, I will never be able to change something. I can finally see that none of that is true, but I have to remind myself every day. I spent over 30 years believing the enemy. Now I'm probably not gonna, now I'm probably gonna spend a long time trying to understand that those lies are the things I believed and they're not true. It's a work in progress, but I finally know that I am loved as a child of God and that I'm worthy of all the amazing things that he has done and that he has in store for me. You know, it's so tempting to celebrate stories where they're wonderful, amazing, fun, like write a book stories. But that's not the epic life that we live. That's not where real life happens. Real life happens in the victories of of things that happen between our ears. Real life victories are the the hurts that we experience. Real life victories are are the little things in life that that are the destination that we're really looking for. The journey with Jesus is the destination. To me, I look at these stories and I think, man, these are the epic lives. It's not the Abraham Lincolns. It's not the Martin Luther King Jr.'s. It's not the presidents and the historians. It's not the people that we're going to write out. The epic life is the person who's just simply walked with Jesus one step. The truth is that, like, if you take a room like this, there's not a, there's not a step that we can all take. We don't all have that much in common. We come from drastically different places. Not all of us wore the little rainbow shirt with the straps over the shoulder. We can't all identify with exactly that step. But the thing that we all have in common is that tomorrow is a new day and that God has a next step planned for you. And the question that I have for you as we wrap things up is just simply that simple. Will will you choose to live in the restoration of the pain in your life? Or do you want to continue living from it? Will you choose to experience 
what God has for you to experience? Or do you just want to live the results and figure out what happens again? I don't know about you, but I'm done with that hopelessness. Let's pray together. Jesus, man, we're just so thankful that you love us, that you um, you offer to bind up our broken hearts and set us as captives free. And, uh, and we wish it was so simple as chains and ropes holding us back, but for us, it's far more substantial and far less tangible. And so, um, God, we just, uh, we want to invite you in, we want to walk with you and experience the restoration from our pain. And that's what you offer, and we just want to take you up on it. Uh, we ask that in your name. Amen.